What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden here. Today we're gonna to talk about how do you do dependency injection in functional programming. Jesse Warden. Mark Seaman did a video about how you use dependency injection in functional programming, specifically around using partial application. That's a functionality in functional programming to have a function take some of its arguments instead of all of it. And it's a really helpful way to compose function together. That's super advanced. And you don't need to know all that to know how to do dependency injection in functional programming. And he makes fun of it, but it really is just arguments to a function. We're gonna cover the object-oriented programming way where you use these dependencies to make these classes easier to test, especially around things that have side effects and you wanna stub or mock them. And then we're gonna show you how to do the exact same thing with very similar code written in functional programming. So you have an idea on, okay, this is dependency injection utilized in object-oriented programming. Here's how I do something similar in functional programming. And once you learn that, then you can start caring about the other things like partial application and function composition and blah, blah, blah. This source here, we have object-oriented code and we have functional code. And there's two folders, the old source and the source. And the old source is when a lot of that code's written that's not testable by default. You can definitely tell they didn't use like test first methodologies or test, you know, test driven development. This config file, what it does, reads in a local JSON file that configures where do you go to QA or production. Whether it's an environment variable or a local file, it doesn't matter, but this is a very common pattern of reading in some kind of configuration, a side effect, something outside yourself, parsing it, and then making a decision around that. And so this config class does those two things. It reads that file in, by getting that environment, it's reading through a, some kind of JSON reader class. And then once it gets that configuration JSON, it plucks off the environment property, the ENV, which is slang for environment. Once you have that environment property, you can then say, all right, if it's QA, get the QA URL. If it's production, get the production URL. So simple decision. But the concept is side effect and business logic decision. These are the two things that we're going to focus on. And this class is really hard to test because all of this functionality is encapsulated inside. And that's usually a good thing in object oriented programming. You want to encapsulate that functionality, but there's no easy way to test it. But the same thing with the reader. The reader simply takes in the file name and reads it. There's no real way to configure this either. Let's focus on the config. We've rewritten this config to have the normally called in dependency injection constructor injection. When you instantiate a class, you pass in the dependencies that it needs. In this case, you only need one. If you're from a TypeScript background, that would be a concrete implementation of an interface. So your class would have that interface that does the methods that you need to do, and you would pass in a concrete implementation your integration test or your actual app. But in your unit test, you would pass in some kind of fake or stub that actually does that. Now that we can pass in that JSON reader and store it internally, when you get the environment, it's gonna use whatever that class instance that you passed in and then call the methods on it. Now, in concrete runtime doesn't really change much. It's using a JSON reader, reading a file, doing JSON parse, not a big deal. But for unit testing, we can now stub that. And so we don't have to worry about it actually hitting disk. It can be a lot more deterministic. We can test both the happy paths and the unhappy paths. Happy being, I read the file and it's good. Unhappy, I can't find the file. I can find the file, but I can't parse it. I can find the file and I can parse it, but the data doesn't make any sense. Those, all those unhappy paths we can test. Let's take a look at what we've modified on the JSON reader as well. The difference here is we've actually got a file reader, a way to actually read files from disk. Now, normally that's the, in Node, that would be the file system module. But in this case, we've got a, another dependency that you inject in as well. Then you inject in the configuration file to read them. Those are the only two changes we've made. Let's take a look at the test to see how we can do a unit test on this. So now that you understand how the config file was changed to have this injectable file reader. It makes it a lot more simple in a unit test to actually test it. So let's take a look at this first test. So we import the class as is, but when we go to say we should get a server URL for QA, right? We want to verify that if we read a configuration file that says QA, the URL should be the QR, QA URL we're expecting. And you have to read from disk somehow. You have to give it a stub. And so rather than implementing JSON and parsing and all that stuff, we just give it a, a simple stub class that has a method name that's the exact same. In TypeScript, this would follow the interface. And it returns JSON that's already parsed, ready to go, in this case, an object with environment of QA. So we can take that stub, inject it, take that dependency and inject it into the class. Now config can use it. So when we call get server URL, we know that that URL is going to equal localhost and you can run the unit test on it. All right, let's take a look at our package JSON. We have two scripts that we're interested in doing 
unit testing, which is stubbing all your dependencies as much as possible. And a lot of people discredit unit tests because test-driven development aside, it's just white box testing. You kind of know all the inputs and outputs. It's deterministic, but it doesn't really test, does the code work? And that's not really what we're looking for. What we're looking for is, A, do we like the design? Does it feel right? Does it feel like it's easy to test and see what's going on and debug it when something goes wrong and you're on happy paths? Second, when you make changes, this is really fast. You want this to fail fast. Maybe something weird happened, especially in dynamic languages. We don't have types. These tests can really, really help. So units are good because they're fast, quick, fail fast, help you find those things. And this is where dependency injection really comes into play a lot from a test perspective. The integration, the only difference between that is that we give it a real concrete instead of a fake stub for a unit test. So the integration is actually really read a JSON file from disk, see if the actual class and program works as we expect. The npm run test unit, just to test that, and it's gonna go through and say our unit test pass, cool. So let's take a look again at that first unit test. The first one took that JSON reader and injected it into config. When we call the get URL, it takes that stub that we passed in. So when you call get server URL, it's gonna call get environment. It's gonna use that stub and automatically call that stub function and immediately pass because it's a stub. It's always gonna work, never fails snag off the environment property and we're good to go. So this is, allows our test to be very deterministic, not worry about side effects. And we can configure this whole class by just injecting that JSON reader dependency. Well, let's talk about the production. The only difference is that the stub returns production. That's the problem we're solving is that we wanna be able to configure this class with some kind of external dependency so it can be more testable. If you compare it to the old one, the old one had the config, the concrete actually implemented it. There's no way to customize it. This get server URL takes no parameters. There's no globals that we can modify in configuration. It's all abstracted away too much. It's too difficult to test. There's just no easy way to test it other than integration testing. We'd have to affect the side effect. Let's talk about the integration test and how would you do that? If we look at the config test, we have a QA configuration JSON and we have a production JSON. In this case, we pass in a real concrete JSON reader we give it a real file system module, and then we tell it the path to test. Now, if you don't remember, the JSON reader, we made that configurable as well. Let's go take a look at this guy in tab. And you can see that it's a JSON reader class. We'll go inside. The JSON reader, the customizable one, takes some kind of file reader. The only real contract is that it has a read file sync method. You give it some kind of file name, and it'll read it out. So that's the same exact thing that the node file system module has. It has a read file sync. It allows you to read a file from your disk synchronously, not having to do use promises or any of that. And you just pass it a file name. So now we give it a real one that reads from disk and reads real files that we already set up as fixtures in our integration folder. We then give that real one to config. So again, config takes whatever dependency you give it. We give it a real one. So when we call get server URL, it's the same unit test. The only difference is actually reading from disk. And so this allows you to configure it, not just for unit testing, but also putting concretes in it if you wanna do some integration tests and maybe tweak out some of those things. That is the wonders of dependency injection inside of object-oriented programming. So how do you do that from a functional perspective? Well, we're gonna show the bad functional code first. So we'll go to functional programming. The only difference between this code from an object-oriented programming and functional is that in functional, we use functions. This is why a lot of functional programmers are considered obnoxious because they say functions are the answers for everything, and they actually are in functional programming. We get a server URL the exact same way. The difference is that we compose functions together. So in object-oriented programming, you would create classes, you'd have public methods to call privates, and then if you needed some extra functionality, you want to follow solid, like the single, you know, one class does one thing really well, you would then use that JSON reader and put it inside. So you'd compose it inside, right? We're doing the same thing in functional programming where you take functions and you kind of wire them together like pipes. And so these pipes connect together and they have inputs and outputs. And so we're using the stage two pipeline operator in JavaScript. If you're not familiar, it's actually a pipe and then an arrow. If you put them next to together in my current font, it snaps them together, just like the arrow function, it makes it look nicer. So it's actually, if you've never done it before, it's a pipe and then a greater than symbol. You just put them right next to each other. But using the Fira code font, it does it together. Now, if you've never seen this style of programming, it's very similar to promises, where you have a value that goes in a promise, it pops out, you do some logic, you toss it back. Sometimes you just return a value, sometimes you return a promise, sometimes you call another function. It's the exact same thing, except this is synchronous. So if you think of arrows as synchronous, promises is usually asynchronous. You can do synchronous stuff in promises, but that's the style. If you wanna change it to a promise-based way of doing things that returns a promise, 
you simply just take this, say promise.resolve, then that'll pass that value to that, then that'll pass that value to that, JSON will parse it, then JSON will come out, you'll snag off the JSON environment and return that automatically, you promise.resolve, you then get the environment that comes out from that JSON resolve, and then you return it. So if you're familiar with promises and how you chain logic together, it's, it's basically the same thing. And this is a stage two, so the syntax could change. I'm using the F-sharp style where you're allowed to do functions and you don't have to use placeholders. There seems to be, at least around Christmas, the idea was use hack style, but we're going to use the pipe style for now. Same exact functionality as config. You give it a file name, it reads it from disks, parse it, snags off the environment, and then text, what do I do with the environment? Instead of using two classes to abstract it away, we do that. However, the same problem the object-oriented class has, this functional module has as well, this function, is that the side effects are deeply embedded and abstracted away. So the only thing we can pass is a file name. So the only way we can test this module is via integration test. There's no way to actually test it. There's no way to inject fakes and mocks and anything like that. We can do the exact same style of dependency injection, except instead of classes putting it in a constructor, we can put it in a function argument. So let's take a look at the new one. Don't save our changes. We're going to go to the new source and look at the difference. The only difference was that I passed the read file function as an argument. Same thing with the JSON parse. So instead of JSON.parse, we actually pass that parseability as a second argument. Now this has a funny effect when you pass all these functions that you expect to do their job to read the file then pass it to JSON parse, because you can now pass whatever function you want. So a function always work. It's a stub. Just like a class that has this function or a method that always works. Exact same concept. And that's it. We still have the same file name as the last. Pass in the read file and parse. We can now pass in whatever stubs we need to guarantee this function always works in a deterministic way. It doesn't actually do side effects and it makes it easier to test. So let's go into the functional folder, run the test real quick. We'll go CD functional npm run. By the way, I have to use Babel to compile those pipes. So just FYI, behind the scenes, I actually have a Babel compiler con uh, converting that to ES5 style JavaScript, I think. So we'll run npm run test unit in the functional code base. Two passing tests, exact same style of test. Take a look at it. That's why there's Babel there. Right here, we should get a server URL of localhost. So same thing as the object-oriented style. We just need a function that when you parse it, it automatically gives you a JSON file back. And so in this case, JSON parse, it would take that JSON from the, the disk and it would give it to a nice JSON object. So we do the parse stub. The read file stub is in theory supposed to give JSON. But because the parse stub is the last to run, we don't really care what the read stub gives because our parse stub always works and it doesn't take a first parameter. And if, even if it did, it ignores it. So we don't really care what the read file stub does in the unit test. We just care about the parse stub. Then we just make up some file name because it's not actually reading from disk, so we don't care. What we do care about is really if the parse stub gives QA, should give the QA URL. And that's how you unit test generally functional programming is you take a function, you give it some inputs, and you assert on those outputs. And you wanna make sure if it follows the rules of functional programming, same input, same output. So I should be able to run this unit test over and over and over, and it should always work deterministically. And just like the OOP one, it does, because we're giving it stubs to work every time. Production, the exact same thing, we just change the value to production, and then it asserts on a different URL. We're following most of the rules. It's not really doing side effects because these aren't actually reading files that are deterministic. So let's take a look at the functional way of doing integration testing using dependency injection, You'll notice it's the exact same thing. We give it a real read file function and a real JSON parse. So now when it goes into the Git server URL, we'll take that read file, which is the fs.read file, it'll read it from disk. Then it takes a json.parse, which will parse that string as JSON. And then if it works, it'll pop it out, snag off the environment. So same, same concept, but this can test that the, the actual integration tests work with concrete. So again, dependency injection, just passing in arguments to a function. In dependency injection and object-oriented programming, passing in arguments to your constructor. From a TypeScript perspective, this might be a little different. A lot of times people in TypeScript, they're typing classes, they're typing objects, they're not really typing function definitions. They might be typing a function, but not passing functions as parameters to arguments, not often. And so there's different ways to type that in TypeScript. So just be aware that it's you can do an interface if you want, but it's just a lot easier to say, look, this function takes an int or it takes a string and returns a promise that has some binary data. Or in, in this case, for sync, it takes in a string of a file path and returns a buffer. 
that's it. You type that, you can pass it to the function, whether it's concrete or stub for you. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you do dependency injection in functional programming. In object-oriented programming, the concept of dependency injection is specifically for making your classes easier to test and easier to be configured based on their dependencies. If they have a lot of different dependencies, a lot of different works, it becomes very difficult to test that class because it's got external dependencies that may be doing side effects and other things that make it really difficult to configure, to say, does my class work? Do I like the way it works? Not just for unit tests, but integration tests as well. If you simply change that and say, look, I want to have my dependencies injected through my constructor, then suddenly you can pass in whatever you want there. As long as it has an interface in a typed class, like TypeScript, for example, you can add some enforcement on that. But at least we have only the constructor when you instantiate the class and then your public method. If they call private methods internally, that's fine. But that way you can configure it to do whatever you want. And that means from a unit test perspective, you can give it a deterministic stub and it'll always return what you want because, well, it's a stub. It always works. And that makes your happy pass and your unhappy pass always work. You get a really good suite, a really fast suite of tests to run all the time. Functional programming, exact same concept. You just, instead of using classes with constructor arguments, you use the function parameters. So normally in functional programming, if you will see people, they'll pass in just functions with arguments and have some kind of output. In our case, we have a, a refactored one, which allows us to pass those dependencies as function arguments up front. And you instantiate those first, give those to your, your first and your, inner, your unit test, and you can pass those stubs in there. Once those stubs are passed in as parameters, then you can pass in your actual data and the function can do the work. And at that point, you're just asserting on the return value of the function. Right? Same input, same output, assert that they are what you expect and run multiple times. So you don't have any side effects and you're following the two pure function rules. That's how you do it, ladies and gentlemen. Using dependency injection functional programming really is just function arguments, at least in jobs. In other languages, they, they change that, how that works. If you're interested in Mark Siemens' video, I, I, I put it as a card earlier beginning, but definitely check it out. He's got a, a really deeply way of exploring this, comparing C-sharp with F-sharp. And the reason that's compelling is because they're both based on compiling the .NET CLR, right? And they're both from Microsoft, so they have that kind of same style. But one, F-sharp is very pragmatic functional. So that you can still do OOP in it if you want to, but it's neat to see the same style and how the F-sharp compiles and it looks almost exactly like C-sharp, which is kind of cool. So his video gives you a really more in-depth way, but it really shows how you can take those function arguments and then use that with partial applications to start composing these functions together into really large programs that have lots of side effects. Very similar to some of your larger OOP classes that have a significant amount of dependencies you inject in constructor. Same problem with functional programming as, you, as it grows. So you use that kind of partial application to do it. Then you take the next step and try to push the IO to the sides. Anything with the side effect, reading files, making web calls, talking to databases, that kind of stuff. So your core is pure. So it makes it a lot easier to test. You saw some of that in your config where it's an environment. You want to keep that core pure, easier to test, and then put the side effects to the side. Second, I've got some videos on partial application, which also might help as well. If you've never seen fun partial application, you can use that as part of that composition. And lastly, I'll put in the description if you're interested on how to do that. Piping syntax in JavaScript, if you're not familiar. By the way, if you if you look at the stage two proposal for it, vote for the F-sharp style, please. It is the best. It is the best way of doing it. The hack style is awful. If you're a functional programmer, you're going to use F-sharp. If you're not, you're not going to use the hack style because you're not going to use pipes and syntax because you're not a functional programmer. So hope you learned something. And if you got any other questions, let me know. Happy to help. Good luck.